All right, good morning, everyone. I'm Zeno Kova, and what I'm talking to, do, talking to you about today is not what I do with the majority of my time. So, the majority of my time, I work at a nonprofit called Open Security Training, and I make free as in freedom, free as in beer, completely open source classes that you can go check out whenever you want. Now, 25% of my time, this is where I do fun research, and that's the kind of research that I'm talking about today. And also, part of the point of the research is just to act as a Trojan horse to get me into conferences so that I can put this slide up there and tell you about open security training. All this work just for that purpose. And just to say, it's not just me at Open Security Training, a bunch of other people putting a whole bunch of their time towards making free classes for you. Most recently, just across the English Channel, we had an English researcher at NCC Group put out over 40 hours of class on Windows kernel exploitation. So that's pretty cool. All right, the research thread here for this work is I want to know what Bluetooth chips are inside any given device when I happen to see it sending Bluetooth packets. So, got some random devices, they all support Bluetooth, and I want to know which specific chip is inside of that device. Now, why would I want to know that? Well, I want to know whether or not it's vulnerable to over-the-air wireless exploitation of the Bluetooth firmware. And so, knowing which chip will help me know whether or not it's vulnerable to something. So, for instance, back in 2018, Armis came out with the first uh, over-the-air wireless exploit against Texas Instruments firmware. This was called Bleeding Bit. In 2019, Simu Labs at TU Darmstadt in Germany, they found vulnerabilities in Broadcom chips. <clears throat> and then in 2020, my wife Veronica Kova found vulnerabilities in Texas Instruments chips and uh, Silicon Labs chips that she presented at Black Hat 2020. So the general hierarchy of the kind of information that we'll be seeing and how it all relates to each other, it looks sort of like this. What I'm really interested in, um, I'm going to... Sorry, for a sec, I'm going to make my mouse bigger because I'm going to be doing a lot of pointing here. <laughs> Accessibility. Big mouse. There you go. All right. What I want to know is these sort of version numbers. I want to know this particular firmware at this particular revision, it's got a exploitable vulnerability in it. And so I want to see that when I see things sending Bluetooth packets. Now, all those various versions are going to be in a particular Bluetooth chip. And you could have, you know, different version numbers that have the same version, the same vulnerability across different chips. So I need sort of this version print to say, like, this specific thing is what's exploitable. So what might help get me there are things like chip prints where I can say, I know that this thing right now has a particular Bluetooth chip, and amongst the vulnerable, amongst the versions are some of the vulnerable things. Um, it might also get me closer to know something like which chip maker it is. That's where I was saying Texas Instruments, Silicon Labs, if I can get to that level. And so here I'm differentiating. There's the chip maker, Texas Instruments, and then there's the chip, the CC2640 and the CC2650, like individual chips with individual firmwares from individual chip makers. There's also another level of this hierarchy called Bluetooth modules. <clears throat> A module maker, uh, I think I put a little picture here. So you can have an individual chip maker like Realtek. You can have module maker of which there's many different module makers and they take a chip and they put it onto some little circuit board like this. And so they're just encapsulating a chip, putting like an antenna on there, uh, putting, you know, um, um, frequency um, crystal to f specify the frequency. And basically their value add is that they get these modules uh, pre-certified by regulatory authorities because that involves like a whole bunch of time and money. And so basically they will sell these particular devices. Thank you. These particular devices pre-packaged, pre-authorized, and you just slap them on a motherboard, and then you don't have to do all the design for your own antennas, the verification, validation of the things. But then when you have all these modules, there's a question of where do they go? So basically, all of these modules will be sold to all sorts of different companies, and what they are at the end of the day, as far as I'm concerned, is they're just real tech uh, Bluetooth chips. So we've got this module maker level, and then now starting from the bottom, we've got product makers, of which there are over 3,000 product makers in, uh, with officially registered designations with the Bluetooth SIG today. So there's a whole bunch of product makers making a whole bunch of products using a whole bunch of different chips and or modules. So in general, there's going to be a one-to-one -one, um, 
uh, relationship between a given product. So, you know, a Tesla has one particular chip, an iPhone has one particular chip. And what I have to do is try to find a way to actually discover this information. So whichever way it is, we got to figure that out. And then one thing that can help us a little bit is that module makers may themselves only use smaller subsets of chips. There's many, many different chip vendors, but a module maker will just pick a couple of different vendors and use only those things. So if we know something about the individual modules or the module makers, that will at least limit down the subset from 20 plus silicon makers down to like three. There's three possible silicon makers for this particular module maker. So in this research, what I really want is I want to know those version numbers. But unfortunately, what I get most of the time is at best a chip maker uh, and at worst, you know, something like just it's a product. And then I have a whole number of steps to go to try to dig down into figuring out what kind of firmware this is using. All right. So my terminology for this talk, BTC stands for Bluetooth Classic, not Bitcoin. BLE is Bluetooth Low Energy and BD Adder is Bluetooth Device Address. And you can think of it like a Mac address. So when it comes to this tooth printing, you know, what are the different ways we can do it? So there's the passive way where you just run a sniffer and the devices themselves may be just sending out packets all the time, advertisement packets, for instance. And so you just run a sniffer completely passively and you're not going to be visible to anyone who's looking around. And so that's nice from a stealth perspective, but unfortunately, most of the time, the information the devices are already spewing out is not sufficient to tooth print it. So then what I have, what I call mostly passive is that when you ask what Bluetooth devices are out there, when you go into like the preferences on your phone or your computer and you say like, show me all the Bluetooth devices, the operating system, like the applications in concert with the operating system in concert with the Bluetooth controller will send out some normal just inquiry type information saying, hey, you know, who's out there? What's your name? Maybe what's your BD adder and stuff like that. So I differentiate, even though this is technically active, I'm differentiating this, I'm calling it mostly passive to say that if anyone ever starts getting into their head the next great anomaly detector for, you know, intrusion detection and Bluetooth and stuff like that, I want to be clear that what I call mostly passive is stuff that normal operating systems and phones and everything are doing naturally all the time. So there's nothing anomalous about this. This is just how Bluetooth works. This is how people detect things. So if you just put something saying, oh, someone's trying to get my name, that's suspicious, why are they scanning me? No, things are scanning you all the time. My bag is scanning you over there right now. Things are scanning you all the time in a natural way uh, that is not actually suspicious. But once we get into more of the active uh, tooth printing, this is where we start getting into the stuff that's maybe considered suspicious. So this is where now you start sending custom like low level packets like Bluetooth link layer or Bluetooth classic uh, link management protocol packets and you custom craft these packets. You throw them at the things and I like this little handball just whipping packets at you. That bag right now is whipping packets at all your Bluetooth devices and saying, what are you? And just trying to figure it out. So super have way too much material and I can already say I'm over time. Thankfully, I cut out a whole bunch of stuff. So I'm only going to cover a couple different ways that we can do this. And then I'll, you know, in the slides, you can check later on. So the first thing, this is the simplest and most naive thing that everyone thinks of for the last 20 years. So we have BD adders, which I said are basically like MAC addresses from Ethernet. I chose a bad picture to reuse. So the upper 24 most significant bits are a company ID. It's a organizational unit identifier. And so it's like that, but it's like that. And so you can say based on the upper 24 bits, this is some particular company, Responix Inc., for instance, Apple, Google, Intel, whatever. And then there are four types of Bluetooth low energy addresses, but we're only going to care about the public address because that looks the exact same way as Bluetooth Classic, where you've got the upper 24 bits is a organizationally unique identifier. So this is the data that I have as of uh, October 26th. I've got about 8.4 million unique Bluetooth devices that I've seen, 8.3 Bluetooth Low Energy and 73,000 Bluetooth Classic. But amongst this data set, the only things that are actually useful for this using the OUIs is about 3% of the data. It's this uh, 260,000 worth of things. So the main first order point is for anyone in the past who's ever said like, oh yeah, I can just totally check, you know, oh, the Bluetooth address will tell me what the company is that's making these things. Um, no, that most of the time in a Bluetooth low energy world, the vast majority of the data is not data that is relevant for this kind of fingerprinting. 
So I put some data here. I don't expect you to read through all of it. Again, it's lots of stuff because I don't have time to make a white paper, so my slides are going to be a bit dense. But the only thing I want you to take away from these slides is that if you see a chocolate chip cookie in the rest of the slides, it means it's a chip-related thing. And if you see a puzzle piece, it means it's a module-related thing. So when I look at the top 20 vendors based on OUIs from my data set, which I need to admit is very skewed towards vehicles because I like to put my Bluetooth sniffers over like freeway overpasses and then just let thousands of people drive underneath my Bluetooth sniffers over days. So it's going to be biased towards cars and things that people might have in their cars with them. So that's why, for instance, we have Garmin. We've got a whole bunch of like one of the most seen things are trucker, um, trucker GPS units, for instance. But amongst these things, the things I want you to pull away is if you see a little chip here, that means action semiconductor, that is telling me, okay, these devices, their OUI will just tell me straight up, it's action silicon, it's Intel silicon, it's Texas instrument silicon. And furthermore, like I said before, if I know it's a module maker, then I can at least pull it down to say, like, Silex modules are using Qualcomm chips. Xinhua are using Sun Plus Cypress and CSR and TI. So... Basically, that was the Bluetooth Classic. This is the Bluetooth Low Energy. And the only point is just to say that sometimes, quote unquote, for free, out of the only 3% three three of my data, I can know, like, straight up, they didn't change their Bluetooth address OUI, and therefore, they're almost certainly using the silicon from the vendor whose OUI is still represented there. So that's the first trace of what I want to know. If the thing says a particular silicon vendor, of which there are many, and we can, you know, enumerate and list this, like, out of the Bluetooth official names or the o uh, IEEE OUIs, which ones are silicon makers, and that'll give us our first uh, visibility. So OUI lookup gives us sort of the manufacturer, potentially, the chip maker, and then we can infer that, okay, this is probably running something like a Texas Instruments chip. All right, link layer version information. This can be semi-active or active, semi-passive or active. So there are two types of packets, one for Bluetooth Low Energy and one for Bluetooth Classic. And these type of things, you can send this type of packet. These are low-level link layer packets. And so they are communicated and their information is retrieved uh, well below the point at which you do any sort of Bluetooth pairing or anything like that. So you maybe think like, oh, Bluetooth devices can't talk to each other until they're paired. Well, these are down at the link layer where essentially all of that initial setup communication goes on for things like Bluetooth pairing. So it all happens before you have to do any sort of authentication. So Bluetooth Classic, the spec, you know, the previous talk was talking about let's turn, use AI to turn specs into code. Well, what if the spec is really, really poorly written like Bluetooth? So this particular spec, like this is how they say the data structure. So this thing is the LMP version uh, request or response, and this is the data structure. It just tells us there's a version number, there's a comp ID, there's a subversion number. doesn't even tell us the sizes or anything like that. Later on in the spec for the Bluetooth Low Energy version, we will see that, okay, version number is one byte, contains the assigned version number, comp ID is two bytes, it's the company ID from the Bluetooth assigned numbers, and subversion number we'll talk about a little bit. So I got scooped a little bit on this point in that there was a Woot paper earlier in the year where the researchers said, hey, check it out, I can send LL version indication packets and I can fingerprint my uh, Bluetooth stack and I can use that to like send the actual exploits against the device. And that's sort of true to, uh, to, a, to a small degree, but they spent all of like one paragraph in their white paper talking about it, just saying this is a thing, we could maybe use it. So I figured I'd, you know, show some actual data about uh, the implications of that. So they had an example specifically for MediaTek and uh, software revision zero. So if I look at my data for MediaTek, which is company ID 70, and the subversion is zero, we can see that that actually is like the most frequent type of thing that we're ever going to see. So basically, just because you see a MediaTek thing and you see it's uh, version zero, whether it's Bluetooth Classic or Bluetooth Low Energy, that is going to be, seems to be probably just like the default. And so for this particular thing, they said like, oh yeah, I can fingerprint it and it's going to be, you know, this particular 
well, they were looking, they were fingerprinting from a watch to some other device that they were looking at. But just looking at my data, I can see if I go look for things that are MediaTek and their subversion zero, it could be this iPad knockoff, it could be these bike locks, it could be a Nokia phone, or it could be some telematics tracking unit. So it can be many different types of devices. Now, you may not care if your whole goal is to exploit some MediaTek, you know, firmware vulnerability. They may all actually be running the same thing. But my only point here is just that single data point in and of itself is insufficient. What we need is really many different data points, and that's where the tooth print comes in. This is one tooth, but we need to work on our smile and get some more teeth. So the overall, just to say a little more about what this type of data is, <clears throat> the version number, it says it's the Bluetooth. It's essentially a Bluetooth spec version that the thing conforms to. And we can use this a little bit to say, okay, if it conforms to spec version 4.2, it maybe talks certain packets, but if it's, you know, 2.0, it's not going to talk some of those packets. And same thing if it's 5.4, now it'll add some additional packets. So it says a little bit about what things we could potentially query it with. And furthermore, we can continue to query it with things that are invalid. Like we can ask for packet types that we know ostensibly something running Bluetooth spec 5 shouldn't even speak. The comp ID is the more interesting thing, and this is basically just from the Bluetooth assigned numbers. Uh, let's see, what did I say? There were, yeah, this was the where there's over 3,000 different companies that have assigned numbers in the Bluetooth assigned numbers document. And so we can use these in order to say something about, you know, does if I send a packet at a device and say, give me your version, and then it sends back data, and two of those bytes in that data is the company ID, then it turns out that this is actually a pretty high signal-to-noise ratio uh, visibility into chip stuff. So basically, it looks like most all of the chip makers, they're sending back their own IDs in these sort of responses to version queries. So this is pretty good. It's like very high signal-to-noise ratio, almost all silicon makers, but... Based on my current data, I saw that about 12% of devices actually respond to this in Bluetooth Low Energy. So it's good if you can get it, but you can only get it 12% of the time. And for Bluetooth Classic, it's a little bit better in that we get about 31% of the time devices will respond to this link layer version request information. But, you know, maybe it's higher. I have to do further research to, to actually take uh, signal strength into account. So I may have data where essentially I'm saying like, hey, please tell me your version, but the thing is like really far away, really low signal. And so the reason it's not responding is not because intrinsically it doesn't respond just because the signal strength was too low. So that's continuing work with a um, with a student. So subversion number then was interesting. When I first saw this, this was like what I was going for. I thought like, oh, for sure, this is going to be the version of the firmware because I read this statement. Subversion field shall contain a unique value for each implementation or revision of an implementation of a Bluetooth controller. So I read that as a firmware person. I said, oh, each revision gets a new subversion number. It's totally going to be a firmware version number, just continuously incrementing. But the silicon makers, of course, read that and they said, oh, that's going to be a new increment of our silicon. So they treat it as a silicon. We have at least one example where we can point at it like very concretely and say, yep, that's what Broadcom thought. And so like if we look at some Linux uh, code, we've got this USB subversion table where they talk about various magic numbers. <clears throat> And those magic numbers correspond to specific Bluetooth chips from Broadcom. So Broadcom 4335C0, silicon stepping, versus Broadcom 4335B0, silicon stepping. So they, you know, just continuously update their silicon over time and change the numbers. So there was, then I re remembered that there's this tool called Internal Blue from those TU Darmstadt researchers. And their thing was specifically, they did a lot of research reverse engineering Broadcom. And so you look at the internal blue firmware directory, got a bunch of Python files, you look through all those numbers, and you realize, oh, all those different firmware files actually correspond to a bunch of different Broadcom numbers. So essentially, what what they had already recognized is that, okay, whenever we see those subversion numbers from Broadcom, it's actually telling me what silicon chip it is. So it's actually a perfect chip print. It basically, it's not just down to the level of like the model number that you normally see. It's model number and silicon revision. So Broadcom can fix things from the A0 stepping to the B0 stepping to the C0 stepping. They will fix things in ROM and like the majority of their code for the Bluetooth firmware is actually implemented in ROM, not normal writable firmware. 
So it could tell us like, okay, B0 stepping had like a ROM bug, but C0 stepping fixed the ROM bug. And so this is a perfect chip print. I would have liked version print, but, you know, I'll take what I can get. So further, you know, basically just further research is needed on this. As of right now, I don't know a good way to infer that a given subversion number, is it like a firmware updating number or is it like a silicon updating number? We would say for MediaTek, it's sort of a re weak reject that it's a firmware number because zero seems to be the default. But unless you literally have a device in your hands and you do a firmware update and you see whether the version number changed or not, it's hard to like accurately infer that. So more research needed. Then um, for link layer packets, version numbers are not the only game in town. So like I said, these are a type of packet that all are processed by Bluetooth firmwares before there's any sort of pairing or anything like that. These are things that go on in the protocols while you're trying to do pairing or while, while you're trying to just do legitimate inquiries about what named devices are in my current area. So they're all non-authenticated types, and so we can just fling these packets at things and say, okay, you know, let me send, tell me your features, tell me your extended features, tell me your name, tell me, let's switch roles, I want to be a master and you can be slave now. Send me a ping. So a whole bunch of different packet types, and if you imagine that, like, the overall goal, you know, I don't, sometimes I put it this way for simplicity in other audiences, but we'd say, if my overall goal is to do the moral equivalent of, like, nmap the Bluetooth devices and do an OS fingerprint, well, you know, nmap OS fingerprints are done by sending a variety of different packet types, and you use those to infer differences between different operating systems. Here I'm trying to send a bunch of various packet types at the low layer and fingerprint the differences in the different firmwares or chips. So, like, I only have time to cover, like, one rel one example of how these various packets or malformed versions of the packets, like the malformed ones, are the more interesting things. So there is a thing called LMP Features Request Extended, and there is a big list of features that you can ask, like, Dear Bluetooth device, which features do you support? And it's a whole big bitmap, and so you get to the first 64 bits, and then if bit 63 is set... That says, hey, by the way, I've actually got more features. Please see my extended feature. Cool. So then there's more definitions of more extended features for page one and page two. So each page is notionally 64 bits. And you can say, like, please send me your extended. First, you say, like, send me your features. You check the bit 63. Does it have extended features? OK, please send me your extended features. <clears throat> so oh, let's not show that yet. Oh, too far. So again, I really don't like the Bluetooth spec. This is how it shows the data structure. It's saying the packet type is LMP features request extended. There are three fields in that packet type. One of those fields, don't know the size here, except if you go read some text, one of those fields, the uh, feature page index specifies which page is requested and the contents of that page in the requesting device. So like if you're responding, it's the contents of the page. But pages are numbered 0 through 255 with page 0 con con uh, corresponding to the normal features mask. So what is it? It's an attacker-controlled value where the attacker gets to say, send me page 0, send me page 1, send me page 2. But there's only officially page 0, 1, and 2 supported by a thing that speaks Bluetooth spec 4.2, for instance. So what happens with the device when you say send me page 3 and 4 and 5 and 6 and 7 and all the way up to 255? What can it do? It can leak information, like maybe you start leaking information, maybe it starts crashing because it hits like an integer overflow because it's doing some math on it or something dumb. It can send back all Fs, it can send back all zeros. You know, officially it says in the spec, if you don't support the page that they're asking for, send back all ones. So, great. That's what it's supposed to do, but do they all do that? You have to look and find out. And how you do that is just sending all these types of packets. So how you send these kind of low-level packets in Bluetooth? Uh, you can use the things like internal blue that I mentioned before, but I find that Sventooth and Bracktooth are more effective. Sventooth was uh, released in 2020, and it only speaks Bluetooth low energy. Bracktooth in 2022, and it only speaks Bluetooth Classic. The reason for this is because both of those are software that is combined with hardware where they put a custom firmware on the hardware, where essentially the software talks to the custom firmware and says, please construct exactly this packet for me. Yes, I know that it's not spec conforming. Yes, I know that it's not valid. Please construct this packet and send it out over the air for me anyways. So this is how we get arbitrary packet creation to then start doing this tooth printing. 
All right, now I just have to, in the full disclosure, I have to say that I have sent a whole bunch of this data and I've collected a whole bunch of this data of the many different, like send multiple different packet types, send many malformed stuff, but I haven't actually analyzed the data because essentially I want to have a core representative sent set of, I already know that these devices are definitely Texas Instruments, definitely Cambridge Silicon Radio, definitely Broadcom, et cetera. So I want to already know for sure that devices are a given chip and then look at this data and say, okay, well, what does this data now say about Broadcom, Texas Instruments, Silicon Labs, et cetera? Uh, because I don't want to like be creating things saying like, oh yeah, sending these five packets in this special order with this special result is equal to Broadcom until I know already that it's Broadcom and I can validate that kind of thing. <clears throat> also, I guess I should say at this point, because it's going to come up again later on, I have a very strong bias towards I care most about tooth printing mechanisms that are quick and fast and like essentially happen in a split second. Uh, if a tooth printing mechanism requires like 5, 10, 15 second round trip, that's not great from my perspective because I want things where you can like two cars driving past each other on a freeway and I can still know like what was that Bluetooth chip in the other car as I'm driving past. And if it takes five seconds, sorry, that's too long. Like they're already long gone. You have lost physical transmission range with those things in that time. So that's just a bias also. And unfortunately, that particular stuff using Bracktooth and Sventooth, they add overhead that always makes it so that it takes not less than five seconds. So still happy to do it for static targets like yourselves, but I really want it to work eventually for uh, very fast moving targets. All right, manufacturing specific data, another type of thing in the Bluetooth spec. There is um, a type, there's a whole bunch of different types of data that can be put into advertised uh, things, things that are just autonomously sent out. And we've got in Bluetooth Classic, there's the concept of extended inquiry request. In Bluetooth Low Energy, there's the advertisement, there's the scan request. This manufacturer data can optionally be included all, in all of those locations. So what the data is, is essentially just two bytes, so 16 bits, that is supposed to be the company identifier from the assigned numbers, that same sort of company identifier we just saw in the link layer packets. So they're supposed to put two bytes to say, here's my company ID, and the rest of it can be whatever they want. It's manufacturer-specific data. Now, unfortunately, the spec lately, 4.2, doesn't say what NDNS should be, so that leads to some garbage data. I found, because this was really annoying me, I found that actually the spec 4.0 did say, by the way, this needs to be little Endian, but they lost that when they transitioned to spec version 4.2 and they've never gained it back again. So because of that, we have data where essentially these companies are sending stuff big Endian or little Endian or both and it just doesn't look good and you have to do some analysis. But anyways, when it comes to the manufacturer specific data in the context of Bluetooth Classic, that's reasonable signal noise ratio in terms of we've got a decent amount of silicon vendors in the top slots here. We've got about half of our top 20. Um, but when it comes to Bluetooth low energy, this is pretty low signal noise ratio. What we tend to see is that Bluetooth low energy advertisements, most of the time it looks like probably the software development kits for these Bluetooth chips. They're saying, dear vendor, you know, if you're, uh, let's say Sony, dear Sony, go ahead and put in Sony ID when you're sending out these Bluetooth advertisements for Sony headphones or TVs or whatever else. So essentially, because of that, uh, we tend not to see this unless, again, they just, for whatever reason, decided like, eh, I'm not going to change the defaults. So it turns out that it's advertising as, you know, Cypress, for instance. All right, then tooth printing by GAT. This is active most of the time, but there's some argument about how it can be done a little bit more passively. So GAT is, it's, it's called generic attribute profile and it runs on top of attribute protocol. And essentially it's basically just a way to say like, Hey, tell me what services you provide and I'm going to get some information back about them. Those services are sort of structured in a hierarchy where you have service as like a wrapping and closing information and then a uh, characteristic as like an enclosed information. So the service may be, here's the service for device information and the enclosed information may be, here's my name, here's my firmware version, here's my software version. So theoretically, you can get every single bit of information that I would ever want about a device through GET. And so is GET the ultimate tooth printing mechanism? Let's find out. So if we open up our phone apps and we run one of these Bluetooth scanners on a phone app, for instance, Blue Fruit Connect here, 
I'm in a grocery store and I see a thing called Instacart and I drill down on like, what is the information it provides? Well, it provides a serial number. So that gives me a toothprint of this individual device. It provides a model number. So that tells me the model. It tells me the manufacturer name, Zebra Technologies. And it has a firmware revision and a software revision. That is, firmware revision is what I'm looking for. And so if I knew that, you know, this particular firmware revision for this particular device had vulnerabilities, great. This tells me which firmware version it is. This particular thing, not super interesting. It's just like a receipt printer. So I'm in a grocery store, receipt printer, just not super interesting. Well, the problem with GET is that you can get all of that great useful information, but you can also get a whole bunch of nothing useful. And so here's some device. It's an IDL 205L. What is it based on GET? I have absolutely no idea. So for those kind of things, how I, you know, I had to cut the entire section in this talk about name prints, but name prints is basically glorified Googling their names and figuring out what it is. So based on the name print, I know that IDL 205 always refers to this Let's Fit IDL 205 Apple Watch wannabe knockoff $30 thing. So great. Sometimes you get super awesome information from Get. Sometimes you get a whole bunch of nothing useful. A lot of times things don't speak Get at all. So there has been some past work using GET information for fingerprinting. And basically this 2019 work, they did do active connections to all the Bluetooth devices. Like they ran around for six months and just, you know, found whatever they found in France on the train and at home and so forth. And they just called the fingerprint, like literally every single bit of information I get about it, that's the fingerprint. And that's fine. And so... Uh, what I found interesting about this was just the notion of they were mostly focused on fingerprinting from the privacy preserving perspective. They called out every single type of information about the device, like this can tell you the device name and that's not good and the device model and the user's name. But like they didn't say firmware is a thing and I'm coming at it now from a different perspective. I'm not thinking about the user privacy. Yes, that's, you know, an issue, but I'm interested in how could this thing be exploited and exploitation is obviously the, the most invasive form of user privacy violation. So the other thing is that they had this table that showed for GAT, you know, these things can take a long time. They can take like six seconds to get the information. From my experience, I've seen things take up to like 24 seconds. And these are things that actually I had in the room with me. These are not things that like there was a bad signal connection to them. So things in the room with me up to 24 seconds. And like I said earlier, as far as I'm concerned, you know, tooth printing, it needs to be a fast and effective thing that I can do as I'm driving past someone. So is, is this the ultimate tooth printing mechanism? This is a strike against it. Let's put it that way. Uh, additionally, like they, they had some data about, you know, okay, we've got lots of device names, 13,000 device names, but then out of the same data set, only 835 firmware revision strings. So you can see that the firmware revision, which is what I'm going for, for this GAT information is much less common. And essentially this is because their data, their data set is heavily skewed towards iPhones. They've got almost 10,000 iPhones. My data set is also skewed towards iPhones and therefore it seems the same sort of distribution. So is this the ultimate tooth printing mechanism if I can't even get the firmware string most of the time? Another strike against it. And then one other just uh, related work that I'll mention because it was kind of interesting. This was same thing. They just run around, run a GAT scanner, but they specifically said like, I'm not going to connect to the device because that's, that's ethically dubious. And I don't agree with that at all, but they just did this sort of more semi-active scanning, just the normal, like they got the first level information, they got the services, but they didn't go in and like the services and the, um, the characteristics, but they didn't go in and like get the actual version numbers and strings out of those. But what was very interesting about this is that they went and built a system for reverse engineering Android apps. And essentially, when you have like a Bluetooth low energy device, and it's going to talk to an Android app, there's going to be these 128 bit UUIDs that are used as part of get. And those are used to say like, okay, my phone app wants to connect to this service, like device information on the, you know, watch or something. And so the phone app has a 120 bit UUID. And so that's going to be hard coded into the Android app. So this was kind of interesting because they have this whole big data set of these UUIDs correspond to these Android app, like com dot Sony dot whatever type things. 
So that's like a super useful data set. They, they gave me access to that data and I'm going to include it to, to make things more useful in the future. So my get printer is like super trivial. It is get tool from the Linux Blue Z stack modified to make things, uh, parsable. Get tool is deprecated these days. Like they don't compile it and include it by default, but I just re-enabled it, changed it to make it machine parsable output and did uh, use it that way. So. Back to like what I actually care about, what silicon is in the random devices that I'm seeing. Some Now, what I want to say is that at the service level, like we're going to talk about the service level here first, service level information, it can, the reason why this is sometimes semi-active or sometimes straight up passive is because Bluetooth low energy devices will sometimes actually just advertise in the packets that they're spewing all the time. They'll say, Here's me, here's some information about me, but by the way, I also support this service and it's 128-bit UUID included in the packet. So they may not say their name, they may not say other information we care about, but they will say this. And so if they happen to be advertising something like this exact UUID, then I would know just intrinsically this device is Texas Instruments because it's advertising a service for Texas Instruments over the air firmware update. And I'll just point out that this particular over-the-air firmware update was a thing that the bleeding bit exploit exploited as like a second thing. They had an arbitrary code execution buffer overflow vulnerability, but then their sideshow exploit was, hey, by the way, it turns out that these Aruba Bluetooth beacons are using Texas Instruments over-the-air firmware update, and, but they actually it's, are just, it's completely insecure, and they just have like a security through obscurity, like send a magic-like value to a GET service, and now it'll re-enable the access, and you can just send an arbitrary firmware and now change out the firmware underneath the device. So other things, uh, we've got Nordic is advertising UART services and firmware update services, both legacy, meaning insecure, and secure versions, which, you know, are they secure or not? Don't know. Have to analyze. We've got Cambridge Silicon Radio over the air update service, Silicon Labs, BGX Express streaming service. I'm looking forward to the thing about Silicon Labs secure boot exploit later on in the conference. I'm suspecting there's going to be some interesting Bluetooth bits in there as well. Uh, and then, interestingly, it's not just silicon level. Apparently, some of these module makers, like Laird, they will advertise things like virtual serial ports. And so the only point here, again, is that if I see this magic number advertised in a packet, I can say with high confidence, this is a device using Laird Bluetooth modules. And I can go look up, well, Laird only uses Nordic chips and Texas Instrument chips and Cypress chips or whatever it is, right? So I can down select from this UUID to, well, it could be these three possible types of chip at least. All right, so that's kind of how we look up this stuff. Here's my data just put here for your perusal later. Only thing I want to say is, uh, again, my data is very biased towards iPhones as well, just because that happens to be a lot of them out there. And so I see the same sort of skew of, okay, you've got all of these characteristics of Apple Notification Center, blah, 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 10,000s of those. But then when we get below that, what's the next most popular? Firmware revision string and there's only 1,600 of them. So that just, again, means there's lots of devices out there but most of them don't actually uh, speak for more revision string. All right, I'm pleasantly surprised by the time I made here. So putting it all together, uh, these are the various different types of data that I've actually found. And again, sorry, because of time constraints, I can't talk about all of them, but they're in the backup slides and they'll be posted as well. Uh, these are the various different types. We've got things like the UUID 128s that I was just talking about, the link layer and uh, packets, whether they're Bluetooth Classic, the OUIs. And I just want to make the point that even if wireless links were not lossy, you can't expect that every single device is going to have every single data type available. This is where I need to do further analysis and more, you know, new, fresh experiments where I can say, okay, at high signal strength, let's constrain it to only getting the data from things where we've recorded the signal strength. If we have high signal strength, do they respond with link layer packets? Do they respond with GAT information? So then I can get an actual proper handle on, it turns out with high signal strength, maybe only 40% of the devices in the world will ever tell you GAT information and so forth. So the Bluetooth printing code for collecting all this kind of information and many more types of information I didn't have time for is available here. And again, this picture hopefully gives you more of a sense of why I'm not calling it fingerprinting, I'm calling it tooth printing. It's not just because it's about Bluetooth. It's also because, you know, it's not just a fingerprint and tells you something. We've got many of these individual teeth, that's individual data types. And if you're missing a tooth, like that's part of your tooth print. Like that's a unique thing about your particular device, your particular silicon. So 
My call to action, I like a little bit better than the previous talks. No offense, Dinesh, but my call to action is join me and together we can rule the Bluetooth galaxy. <laughs> Don't take up my time clapping. <laughs> okay, so yeah, that's just a nice convenience that he had a call to action. I have a call to action. That's my call to action. Uh, the key thing here is that Bluetooth vulnerability assessment. I said my wife came out with Bluetooth over-the-air wireless exploitation arbitrary code execution vulnerabilities. She posted the pox. You can all play with them as well. She did this at Black Hat 2020, but we didn't make a big deal about it because we don't know where those apply. I've subsequently done you know, other talks talking about like all these various places I'm seeing, Texas Instruments and stuff like that. Silicon Lab, same thing. But we don't know where they apply. And neither do you. And neither does anyone else. Neither do the silicon makers themselves. They may know, like, I sold these chips to this company, but they don't know, you know, unless you can, like, track everything down from, dear Texas Instruments, tell me who you sold this to. Okay, dear module makers, tell me who you sold it to. Dear product makers, please tell me every single product that ever used this chip. Nobody knows where exploits at this level are applicable. And doing this research to try to get some of that information, um, uh, visible. So I'm putting together a blue crew, and if you want in, let me know afterwards. We basically need more people doing this research. Um, unfortunately, it's not all. We, it's not always sexy. This kind of research has to start by reading the fun manuals, reading the related work. To that end, I've put together a um, organized timeline, like the things that I used to do for UEFI and, and firmware and stuff like that. This is just 200 plus papers from the last 20 years of Bluetooth stuff and saying like all uh, semantically tagged and saying like, okay, this paper talks about link layer exploits. This paper talks about GAT. This paper talks about machine in the middle attacks and stuff like that. So I've organized this information to try to make it easier to start getting into the field. But ultimately, uh, it's not going to be super easy until I go off and make open security training classes about this, right? So, again, this is my 25% of my time just for fun and as a Trojan to get in front of you and speak. It's all about this slide right here. Uh, what I do with my 75% of my time is make free classes and just put them online. So we will be making Bluetooth classes once I'm done with my next class, which is Risk Five, and once my wife is done with her next research, we'll get going on these Bluetooth classes so that we can bootstrap more people faster to become Bluetooth researchers because there's a whole bunch of open problems and I'm happy to enumerate them for people who want, you know, a free research topic. But, uh, but yeah, in the meantime, there's all sorts of cool stuff you can learn about reverse engineering, firmware, operating systems, internals, exploitation, and so forth at Open Security Training. And I'm just absolutely blown away by how fast I did that. I mean, I can definitely cover like a whole bunch more stuff if you want, but we're not going to. I'll take a few questions. Thank you, Xena. Uh, I wonder how many people turned off their Bluetooth while you were talking. But, if you uh, did, it was too late. <laughs> Anyway, uh, do we have any questions for Xena? We have two candidates. Thank you very much. Um, I was wondering if for the initial fingerprinting that you can do kind of offline, where time is less of a problem, uh, you've tried the analog approach. So probably the same manufacturer, you know, have a same kind of fingerprint in the analog domain if you mm -hmm. look at the signal, something like that. Yeah, I 100% anticipated that question for this conference. Basically, like, are you fingerprinting, are you tooth printing the phi layer? So I personally am not an electrical engineer. I've never done any RF stuff, like proper RF stuff, so I'm not qualified to do that kind of thing. What I can tell you is that there has been prior work where they did attempt to do fingerprinting of RF signals on devices. I, the way I would put it... Um, how do I be diplomatic about this? It They do not have enough data for the results to be conclusive. It's like I had eight devices, and I looked at the RF signals for those eight devices, and I could see that the RF signals were different between those eight devices. And so is that indicative of, like, all eight devices had different silicon? Is it indicative of individual silicon where it's the same chip, the different chips are maybe different, and so they have individual fingerprints for individual ones? I believe that there's been some research also in this area in the Wi-Fi space, same thing, just like five-level fingerprinting, can you tell like one device from another? 
there, like I didn't read the Wi-Fi stuff because I'm interested in Bluetooth, but I get the sense that in general when people come at this problem from the file layer, a lot of the times they're more interested in what I would call the individual device fingerprinting rather than certainly the silicon fingerprinting. They're trying to say, in a crowd of people, could I find one particular fingerprint for that guy? And now later on when you all start running around, can I keep following that fingerprint because of the wireless characteristics? There's definitely some better work that I would say is along those veins, and it's still individual fingerprint related, m more focused on like timing skew and stuff like that. I, I don't remember if I have this slide that I can unhide it. But, uh, but yeah, like there's some, some good work focused on like timing skew where essentially they say like, I can definitely tell like individual device skews at this particular time and individual other device skews at this particular time. Let's see if I have the picture hidden here somewhere. There it is. Yeah. <clears throat> no, because it's hidden. Yeah. So like that's an example of where they, you know, cleaned up individual device fingerprinting. I'm not interested in individual device fingerprinting. I'm not interested in, in tracking. Like this is usually more in the like privacy and tracking sort of threat space. Uh, I'm more interested in the like arbitrary code execution vulnerabilities on firmware threat space. So, so the answer is no, I didn't check it. Some other people have kind of checked it. They didn't check enough stuff for it to be scientifically relevant. And yeah. Thank you. We have another question here. For your um, for the scanning and the speed of scanning, what was the particular hardware that you preferred using? Um, the what I'm doing effectively right now. Yeah, that's a good question. So I'm using whatever uh, the current recommendations for Sventooth and Bracktooth are. Uh, one of them uses a Nordic NRF dongle. I don't think I have it listed here, but basically, um, Bracktooth uses an expressive, uh, ESP32 dash, I can't, rover, like development board. So they have a particular ESP32 development board. And so I have like a main x86 PC because Bracktooth and Sventooth don't, uh, work on ARM. They were compiled as, their, their full source code is not available right now. Uh, they're only available as binary, Lin Linux 64 bit binaries. So, I have to get an ARM PC, sorry, an x86 PC. I have a little small factor x86 PC, and again, that uh, all the details of this are actually at the uh, the Bluetooth printing thing. It it has like here's all the hardware you got to buy to set up the equivalent setup. But um, but yeah, small form factor x86 PC. That from that one, I do the normal like Linux like. Who's out there? Who's out there? Who's out there? I use that to collect the BD adders that then I use the BD adders and say, okay, now let's tooth print this one with Brack tooth and GAT tool. Let's print this one with uh, Sven tooth and SDP tool or something like that. That's the reverse. But, but yeah, so basically there's a Nordic dongle. It's just the simple little $10 Nordic dongle for Sven tooth. And there's like a $40 development kit for Brack tooth that they use. And then other than that, it's just a normal x86 PC. And so. the last question from here. Hello. You talk about how uh, there are a large variety of uh, gap response times, mm -hmm. and th you, you had a list there of various different different response times. Is that likely to be a good fingerprint for, say, firmware, where you know lower lower version firmware might be a bit quicker than, say, a later version firmware that's that's an interesting question. Like, I think you're right. That probably could be a component of future tooth printing things. Like basically, if you start to know like these particular devices, like a chip runs at a certain speed and therefore when it's running a particular firmware, there's a max speed that it could possibly respond to you. That's part of why they take so long, you know, six seconds and whatnot. So the super slow chips will respond with one speed. Yeah, I think that could be a relevant component to future tooth printing stuff. But I haven't looked at it. Yeah. Wondered if it was too noisy, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's when I'm making the student redo some experiments in a cleaner way where she like restricts it to only high signal strength things so that we can, you know, be a little bit more reliable in that regard. I think I'll have them check. I, I was going to have them check overall time, but, you know, I think that would be a relevant thing as well. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Thank Sina. You. Let's give a warm round of applause to Sina again.